So welcome everybody to uh, the session trade of this uh, conference. So let me briefly introduce the speakers. The first one is Oscar uh, Lemmers from the um, Statistics Netherlands. And uh, he will present a paper on uh, capturing heterogeneity in global value chains. Then the second speaker will be Basil Alimo from Collegio Carlo Alberto and University the Institute di Torino. He will present a paper on the role of misallocation and the relationship between trade and income inequality. Finally, I will, uh, I'm Daniele Moschella uh, from Scuola Scuola di Sant'Anna, uh, Pisa, Italy. And I will present a paper on uh, international patent protection and trade. So uh, just to, 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 uh, to recap, uh, each presenter will have 20 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes uh, will be left from question and answers that I will uh, uh, moderate. Uh, so please try to stay within uh, the time limits of 20 minutes. I will uh, act as a um, timekeeper. So I will um, tell you when there are uh, five minutes uh, left for the presentation. Um, okay, so let's start with the first first presenter, uh, Oscar Lemmers. He will present a paper uh, on capturing heterogeneity in global value chains, how to slice and dice. Please, Oscar. Yes, thank you for this introduction, Daniela. Indeed, I will share you some thoughts uh, of Statistics Netherlands, uh, where we do have a big globalization program, how to measure globalization, how to develop new methods and today I will tell first okay what would we like to know which type of information what is the problem how to get there I will compare two methods to get the necessary results um, and then apply that to SMEs in the UK and their trade with countries inside and outside the European Union of course we will conclude with conclusion and discussion well, what type of information would we like to have? Uh, we know that in the beginning there was trade in general, but now in more and more policy is targeting specific types of enterprises. It can be SMEs, startups, firms led by female entrepreneurs, maybe some regional initiatives, uh, and they do that to make globalization more inclusive. Everybody gets a piece of the pie. Now we know everything about direct exports and which industries are taking part, which uh, type of firms, the big ones, the small ones, multinationals, non-multinationals, and so on and so on. And we know that SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises are less prone to export. So that means that the policymakers are getting very nervous because they might be missing out on all these emerging markets where trade is booming, uh, where the economy is booming contrary to the old continent, Europe. Now, what we do not know is these indirect exports, uh, supplying in the value chain of exporters. And the goal is how to, to have some methods to quantify that. Now, in a general setting, the usual workhorse would be an input-output table. And you see one over here, and you have industries, you have value added, imports, exports, consumption, investment. You can see who is uh, supplying whom with which amount. And now you see already the problem because in this diagram, you can do wonderful things on industry level, but there is no SME to be seen. So that is a problem. Uh, you, if you want to have SMEs in your analysis. So what you would need is something like an extended input-output table. Uh, another picture over here. What has happened is that every industry has been split in two parts. You have an SME part and you have a large enterprise part. And the next slide will show why is it necessary to, to make those splits. Well, the reason is that there is heterogeneity in, uh, all, in an industry. Uh, you, 
the general assumptions of input-output analysis assume that everybody in the industry is the same, but we know that it is not true. We know that SMEs are really different, even as a group from large enterprises. They have far less imports and exports in the total inputs and outputs, for example. Now, there are two methods that we know of to tackle the problem and to create such an extended input-output table. One, time and data consuming, but really, really good. The other one, quick and dirty. And you can imagine, well, what to do. Uh, the question, one of the questions I will answer in this presentation is that if the results of the two methods really differ that much. Uh, so one method to make some extended input-output table, I will call it the extended supply-use table method, because supply-use tables in national accounts are the usual path to input-output tables. What happens there is that you build up the table from scratch, and you build it up with all the microdata that is present. You would need production, you would need use, imports, exports, uh, everything at industry times type of enterprise level and even at the product level. And that is a very big constraint on your data. You need everything at product level. If you have all the data together, then you can build an extended input output table uh, using proportionality and you know the type of suppliers and how the proportions are, are over there. You know the users and you know also the proportions over there and you use that type of information. Another way to arrive at an extended input output table is the so-called shares method. Uh, the OECD has done some great work there. And uh, what they do is they start with an existing input output table. So not from scratch, but something that exists. And then you use shares on industry times type of enterprise level, imports, exports, value added and production. You split the input output table and you arrive at an extended input output table. You do not need product detail, that's a good thing. And also Miao at Fortinier, they showed that uh, the way to use the shares method, uh, several assumptions are involved and the results are robust under these assumptions. Now, of course, both methods have advantages and disadvantages. And what is really, really nice about the extended supply use table method is that it integrates data at product times industry level. And then you get good quality. It's also very flexible because you can take out on a micro level already implausible combinations. So this is the gold standard. Disadvantage is that it is very consuming on time and data. And you need everything at the product level. The shares method, however, uh, needs far less data and time, at least a factor of five in my experience, uh, but the quality might be lower, might be even much lower. But in practice, for outside researchers who do not have access to microdata, it's the only feasible method. Now, some considerations on the share method are that uh, if you look at the table, already big parts of it are 100% correct because you know total production, value added, imports and exports, you know what they are. So already a big chunk of supply and demand you have taken care of. And then you might hope that the intermediate part of the input output table, that what happens there is not that exciting so that it will not make a big difference if you make some errors there so that the international trade indicators will be okay. But how the domestic part of the economy is taken care of, one, do not, one does not know. Now, the good thing is that at Statistics Netherlands, we had a project where we built up such an extended output output table all the way from scratch, using a lot of microdata. We have a publication about it. Um, I used that extended input output table that was compiled uh, and then used it as an example uh, for the shares method. And the table has 58 industries that are split and 16 that are not split. And it doesn't make much sense to split government and SMEs and large enterprises. 
And I looked at three types of indicators, domestic value added and share, domestic value added and exports as a share of total exports, the importance of the value added and exports relative to your total value, and also a spillover effect, how much do other industries benefit from the exporting ones. Well, you will see in the table that the difference are negligible and no difference to be seen at all on a macro level. Now you might wonder, okay, this is the macro level, but what happens if I zoom in more because policy makers are interested in details as well. Um, it turns out that the difference there are relatively small as well. Uh, I looked at the domestic value added in exports. I have that for each industry time size, size class in each method. I took the difference of those two and you see that everything is very much concentrated around zero. Uh, there are some uh, accessions a little bit larger, a little bit smaller, a bit of an outlier here, but in the paper I have a good explanation for that. In the paper I also show results for the other indicators and there it also turns out that the results are very similar respective of the method. So that's why I thought okay it's a conference in London so let's uh, consider something the data about the United Kingdom when I was writing the paper, the Brexit was the biggest thing to worry about. The, the virus hardly existed. Um, the current administration, the United Kingdom, is aiming for better trade agreements. Uh, countries inside the European Union, outside the European Union. Uh, the exports of goods are most likely to be influenced by these agreements and also by customs procedures. And one can wonder how is that going to work out for SMEs and large enterprises? Um, earlier work, I could not find that much. I did find an article of Mion, I hope I pronounced it correctly, who showed that there is quite some heterogeneity between exporting enterprises. And he considered how much value added do they have in their own exports, but due to the type of data he had at his disposal, he could not look at the whole value chain and not at the suppliers, the suppliers of the suppliers and so on, who are responsible for the indirect value added. Now the data I used concerns the year 2016. I got my input output table from the OECD, uh, the value added, turnover, imports and exports, industry level, each industry split by SMEs and large enterprises. Eurostat had that available. What I did not have, which is a pity, is international trade and services. So that's why I only consider the, so what I call industrial imports and exports, uh, industries that hardly produce services, like manufacturing and agriculture and mining. I didn't find a national input output table. That's why I used that one of the OECD. Now, if you look at the results, uh, we have four bars over here. We have gross exports, value added in exports, intra-EU, extra-EU, and what you see is that uh, the gross exports, that there the share of the SMEs is, well, it's, it's larger, of course, inside the European Union. It's easier for small enterprises to make contacts inside a union to, to closer countries instead of countries really, really far away. We see that what the SMEs earn due to exports, the green, purple, and light blue part, that in total that is already a bit larger than the share in gross exports. And if one looks at extra EU, one sees that that part, what do they actually earn with, their, with exports of the whole country? not only their own exports, but also that of others, you see that there, their share is increasing even more. What is also very important to notice over here is that what the SMEs earn with their own exports, the, the green part, is in size similar 
to the light blue part over here where they earn money, where they have value added due to the exports of large enterprises. Um, and that is visible here as well. And when we look at the channels, uh, how do different types of enterprises earn money uh, abroad? What are the channels, the gateways they use? Uh, and there you see the similar results, of course, only now it's in monetary value instead of in percentages. Okay, so if we look uh, at the discussion, uh, the methodology, um, it's necessary to tackle heterogeneity in global value chains uh, because the policymakers, they want new information about all types of, types of firms. So we have to arrange that. We need new methods. Uh, one method, the extended supply use tables method, really, really nice, good quality, but needs a lot of time and data. Shares method uses far less resources. Beforehand, we did not know the quality, but now we see that both methods, they yield similar results. So answering the question in the title of my presentation, uh, it doesn't make a difference how you slice and dice the, the tables. What is there to be done uh, for my homework, so to speak? Now my example is about one country in a very specific state, so I would have to get some more comparisons to check for robustness. The takeaway from the results about the United Kingdom, uh, in my opinion, are that SMEs, the share they have in the value added of exports, so what they actually earn. Oscar, you should finish in uh, five minutes. Yes. Ah, okay. You. Very good. <laughs> uh, uh, what they earn with their exports, not only their own exports, but also the exports of others by supplying in the value chain. And that is uh, much larger, 13 percentage points larger than their share in the gross exports when it concerns extra EU trade. We see that that is possible because what they earn due to their own exports is similar size to what they earn due to the exports of others where they supply them in the value chain, which shows that these large enterprises, they are a way of passage, a gateway to the rest of the world and the countries where the economies are booming, uh, they provide as a means a possibility to to get there and in the paper I show that the links between the large enterprises and the SMEs is usually only one step so not really long value chain which is complicated but an SME providing goods and services to large enterprises that export and it could be anything it could be materials but it could also be like cleaning accounting um, uh, what is it called, the security and so on, all types of possibilities. And this is the reason why Statistics Denmark and the OECD, they made the suggestion to policymakers that if you would like to make globalization inclusive for SMEs, so that they can also benefit from growth worldwide, that you can do that by stimulating those SMEs to export themselves go to those foreign markets, uh, to China and Argentina and the US, uh, far, far away. Yet another way to arrive at a goal, this inclusion, is to facilitate an ecosystem between SMEs and large exporters where they all cooperate very well. Okay, this was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. and. Please do ask questions now or later via email. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Oscar. Um, um, also start with you. No? Uh, okay. So thank you, Oscar, for your presentation. Um, uh, there are no.
questions within the, I mean, uh, the, the question and answer facility. So maybe uh, other attendees will try to ask you something by mail. I don't know if there are uh, uh, questions right now, but just to remind you that uh, you can ask questions during the session just by using the uh, Q&A facility at the bottom of the screen. So, okay. So if there are no question, I think we can uh, uh, leave the floor to the second uh, presenter, Bezov Alimov from uh, Collegio Carlo Alberto and uh, Università degli Studi di Torino. Okay, so um, please, base of the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, again, uh, you will have uh, 20 minutes. I will um, uh, keep the time. Uh, attendees, uh, other presenters can ask questions by writing in the Q&A chat. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, I will moderate uh, uh, questions. I think Sanjeev has a question. Sanjeev, are you in? Ah, to... okay. Sanjeev, can you hear? Sanjeev, are you there? I've tried to unmute. There we go, we can hear you now. Oh, All yeah. right, okay. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, first observation I would make is I, I did like very early on your delineation of supply news tables and empowerment tables in the link. But sometimes it was a bit confusing because the terms are used interchangeably. Um, but just, that's just a sort of observation comment. But in terms of the supply use tables, the extended ones that you compiled, not using the shares, but the more detailed version. Did you separate, for example, um, the different purchasing structure? Did you actually use different data? Because obviously the large enterprises and the small and medium sized enterprises have different input structures within an industry and across industries. And the relationship with those input structures through primary inputs to exports is very different. So I was surprised at the closeness of the results and i'm just wondering is there a function of how they've been compiled that may lead to the reason why the results are so close yes i think that's a very good question also a very valid question is the the way of construction responsible for these results um, and it is not it is uh, first the type of data that was used to to make the extended supply use tables and there were several sources to do so, and not only the imports where you will have all the detail of the products that you would like to have available, but also in the structural business statistics, there is some information uh, about the, the inputs of an enterprise, so that even if you are in the same industry, that uh, you can see the differences in the input structure uh, on a product level uh, between small enterprises and large enterprises. Of course, the detail is not as large as an international trade, but there is still some detail available. Um, also, in the paper I mentioned of my colleague Chong and, and others, there we also looked at the differences between the large and the small enterprises, if there are differences at the industry level. Um, we also had a look at the actual uh, supply use tables, if we see differences there. And there, indeed, we see the differences there, substantial differences, statistical significant differences. So they are there. And therefore, I do not think that they are the, the primary drivers of the results that we see now, but that I think that the the primary driver of the results that we see is that the actual methods uh, turn up 
similar results. So not by construction, but by not by construction of the, the input data uh, for the methods, but because the methods uh, simply uh, arrive at the similar end results. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, so I would move to the second presenter, based of Alimov. Okay, hello. Okay, uh, so the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, I'm Beza Telimov. Sorry. One minute, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So you have 20 minutes and I, I will uh, remind you when uh, there are uh, five minutes uh, left for your presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Beza Telimov. Um, okay, just one uh, clarification. Like uh, I was affiliated with the uh, Collegio Carlo Alberto and the University of Turin uh, in the first half of this year uh, where I've uh, earned my PhD recently and now uh, I've started my uh, academic position at Westminster International University in Tashkent so that's why there is uh, this difference between the program and like my slides here so I work at Westminster International University in Tashkent so um, yeah my uh, presentation is about the role of misallocation in the relationship between trade and income inequality okay uh first briefly i'll um, it's not brief but uh, i'll speak about uh, motivation theoretical motivation then uh, about data methodology results and then conclude okay uh now uh, research about the effect of uh, trade openness on income distribution provides uh, quite mixed results uh, most of the theoretical studies and some empirical studies, they show that uh, trade openness increases the skilled unskilled wage ratio or wage inequality. But other uh, empirical studies they suggest that trade, uh, trade openness even may reduce income inequality at least beyond a certain point. And uh, to see why misallocation might be uh, an important factor that, uh, that may determine the, how, how trade affects income inequality, I present a very simple uh, framework, theoretical framework. Now, uh, suppose that firms produce a single output uh, using three inputs. So capital, skilled labor, and unskilled labor. And uh, the, the production function is, is of the constant elasticity of substitution form. And uh, so here we have capital. So H is the skilled labor and L is the unskilled labor. And uh, now, like firms maximize their profits. Uh, so this is the profit function. WL is the uh, wage rate of the unskilled. WH is wage rate of the skilled. And R is the return on capital. And uh, then maximization of this profit function gives, ri gives rise to this uh, first of the conditions. So um, X here is just the ratio of the capital to the labor aggregate. Now, uh, assume that the economy is of size one and it consists of four types of agents. So we have L unskilled workers, we have uh, H skilled workers, uh, U unemployed and Kappa working capitalists that make up a certain fraction of H. And uh, what this implies is that the sum of the H plus L and H and L and U uh, make up one. Now, uh, we can consider two uh, ratios here, like inverse relative demand for skilled labor, uh, WH over WL, and the inverse demand for domestic capital relative to unskilled labor, so R divided by uh, WL. You can see that this WH over WL, this inverse relative demand for skilled labor, is a, a negative relates to the uh, to the ratio of uh, skilled to unskilled workers, and the uh, R over WL is a negative relate to the capital to labor ratio. And uh, for simplicity, I assume that the supply functions of the skilled and unskilled workers are uh, as follows. So this is the supply of uh, unskilled workers. So both of them 
range between zero and one because uh, we assume the economy of size one. And uh, whenever the uh, wage rate of this unskilled is small than one, uh, the uh, supply of unskilled labor will be zero. Whenever it's greater than a certain number, so say it's the Euler's number, it will be one. And in between, when, uh, uh, when the uh, wage rate of the unskilled is between one and the Euler's number, it is, uh, the, the supply is ln, so logarithm of the, of the WL. And uh, we have uh, something similar to the uh, um, skilled labor, so it is uh, between zero and one. And when the wage rate of the skilled is between the wage rate of the unskilled and the Euler's number, the supply will be uh, natural logarithm of the WH over WL. And uh, whenever it is greater than the Euler's number, so we have one minus ln WL. So now assume without, less of, uh, without loss of generality that uh, like the wage rate of the unskilled is between one and, and the Euler's number and the wage rate of the skilled is greater than the wage rate of the unskilled and not greater than the Euler's number, then the inverse supply functions of unskilled and skilled labor would be like this. So WL is exponent of L and WH is exponent of H plus L. Now, uh, if we take the, the uh, ratios, then the, we have the inverse relative supply of skilled labor, which is uh, equal to the exponent of H. And uh, for the supply of capital, so I assume that the supply of domestic capital is simply an increasing function of income and savings. And uh, if, uh, if we formulate the capital supply in terms of the return to capital, so we can write it like R equal to some function psi of Y and K, and then the inverse supply of capital relative to unskilled labor would look like this. So R over WL is uh, this function psi divided by exponent of L. And then if we plot these uh, functions, we'll get something like this. So here we have the relative demand for skills and the relative supply of skills. And here we have the demand for capital relative to unskilled labor and the supply of capital relative to unskilled labor. So what this shows is that uh, like uh, whenever the relative demand for skills or the demand for capital relative to unskilled labor increases, whenever it shifts upwards, so we have uh, an increase in, the, in income inequality and whenever relative supply of skills or supply of capital relative to unskilled labor decreases, uh, or shifts rightward, so we'll have uh, a reduction in, in the income inequality. Now, uh, theoretical literature discusses uh, different mechanisms through which trade uh, may affect income, uh, wage or income inequality, but uh, what they have in common is that this effect of trade on income inequality, it uh, occurs by changing the relative demand for uh, factors, the relative demand for skilled workers mostly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we think within the Hecksch-Rowling framework, then trade liberalization increased the relative demand for capital in a capital abundant country and uh, relative demand for labor in a labor abundant country. Uh, and uh, furthermore, we can also uh, think uh, like uh, within the, the with the pers in perspective of Ajim Moglu, who shows that trade liberalization may increase both demand for skilled workers and imports of, of capital goods, in which case then uh, it, it would uh, reduce demand for domestic capital. So whenever we speak about the effect of uh, trade on income inequality, it's reasonable to speak about the, uh, the effect of trade on the, uh, on the relative, uh, on the, on the, uh, so how trade can change the relative uh, factor demands. Now, um, I ask the question, do distortions in the labor and capital markets which, uh, which leads to the sales misallocation, influence the relationship between trade and income inequality. And to see this, uh, suppose that there are two types of distortions in the, in the economy. So we have skilled labor distortions, we uh, denote it by tau h, and we have capital distortions, which is denoted by tau k, and we assume both of them are greater than or equal to minus one in, in value. And uh, like uh, skilled labor distortions, they, they may, lead to differences in access to, uh, to skilled labor um, and capital distortions may lead to differences across firms in access to credit or equity capital. And uh, then with these distortions, the profit function of, of, uh, of firms would look like this. So here we have one plus tau h, so we multiply double h times h with this one plus tau h. So tau h is the uh, distortions, like skilled labor distortions. And 
this one we would multiply but uh, by one plus uh, tau k so tau k is the uh, capital distortions and uh, we have this first set of conditions so there's no need to pay a deep attention to here but now with the relative uh, factor demand functions with distortions would look like this now now we would uh, this shows that the relative demand curves at uh, any um, at any level of the of the factor prices they would be now uh, what they would go downward or shift downward whenever this tau h and tau k are greater than zero. And uh, whenever they are small than zero, they would, uh, this demand, relative demand curve shifts upward. So then uh, this means that if both tau h and tau k are positive, meaning that if distortions in the, uh, in the labor and capital markets act as, as, uh, as a tax on, on the use of these inputs, then, uh, misallocation reduces uh, the, the income inequality. And uh, in the opposite case, it's, it's vice versa. Now, how can we, like, I'm, I do not model trade here, but I just uh, leave it to the empirical part. But uh, now if trade shifts the relative factor demand curves upward, which means if trade increases income inequality, then misallocation would mitigate this uh, adverse effect of trade, adverse distributional effect of trade uh, in case both uh, uh, skilled labor and capital distortions are greater than zero, and uh, it would exacerbate this adverse uh, effect of trade in case both of them are smaller than zero, and uh, vice versa in the opposite case. Now, uh, for the empirical analysis, I use two different measures of income inequality. I use the market gene index from uh, standardized world in uh, income inequality database, and I use the ratio of top 10% to bottom 40% of the population income distribution, which is also known as the Palma ratio. Uh, which I obtained obtain from the United, United Nations University's uh, World Income Inequality Database. Uh, and the Gini index here the, uh, is based on the pre-tax national income, so it's market Gini index, uh, and the latter index, which I use, is uh, based on the equalized household disposable income. And for trade openness, I use uh, exports plus imports as a percentage of GDP. And uh, now as a measure of uh, misallocation, so like to serve as uh, the basis for my measure of misallocation, I use the uh, measure of allocated efficiency, which is proposed by Oli and Pakes. So Oli and Pakes, they, uh, in a seminal paper, uh, they decompose the industry level productivity, uh, which is here denoted by capital phi, uh, phi t. They decompose it into two parts. So now the, Industrial level productivity can be uh, written as the weighted sum of the firm level productivities in this industry. So here, uh, theta is the size of the firm, theta i is the size of firm i, and phi i is, uh, is the productivity of firm i. So we can then decompose this uh, industrial productivity into the unweighted uh, firm level productivity, this phi bar, and this uh, covariance term. So this is the covariance between size and product. Uh, this can, yeah, this is the, uh, a good measure of allocative efficiency because it shows the extent to which uh, firms with higher than average productivity also are larger in size. Now, um, I take the unbalanced data for the OP covariance uh, from the Competitiveness Research Network database, which is compiled by uh, the European, Central, European System of Central Banks, the Halle Institute and Tenberger Institute and other uh, institutes. And the, the database includes uh, 18 European countries for the period 1999 to 2016. And uh, I use the OP covariance based on the log of the average labor activity, but in order to, uh, directly uh, interpret it as misallocation, I take the opposite of this OP covariance and normalize it to take the values between zero and one, where zero means uh, the, the highest uh, allocated efficiency in my sample and one means the highest misallocation. Um, I also control for other factors like, such as the real GDP per capita, financial openness, uh, research and development expenditure, unemployment rate, domestic private credit, uh, tertiary enrollment rate, gross fixed capital formation, and so on. And my uh, model is, is dynamic panel model. So the inequality is uh, is uh, regressed on the uh, on its own leg, 
uh, on the GDP per capita and square of the GDP per capita to account for the potential Kuznets effect and uh, trade misallocation. And here I take the misallocation with one leg in order to uh, avoid the endogeneity, which may be caused by the effect of trade on inequality, uh, which goes through misallocation. And uh, here the interaction between trade and misallocation and uh, have financial openness are in the expansion unemployment. And as here include the potential uh, shifters of the supply of inputs, such as the share of educated workforce, uh, domestic investment, uh, domestic credit supply, and other uh, controls. And the eta C is, is the country specific fixed effect. I use the, so because my uh, sample is not a large sample because uh, both the uh, time dimension and the cross section dimension are smaller than 30, I use the uh, least square down variable estimator with bias correction, uh, bias corrected uh, LSD estimators. So I cannot use uh, typical uh, GMM type dynamic estimators. Now I use three different estimators. I use panel corrected standard errors, which is suggested by Beck and Katz. And I use bootstrap based bias correction for fixed effects. So BCFE estimator as proposed by uh, Everett and Potsy. And I use the bias correction for least squares done variable. So LSDVC estimator uh, as suggested by Bruno. And okay, this is not very important. And uh, yeah, these are my results. So uh, I find that trade seems to, uh, so the first column, it is the uncorrected LSDV estimator. So typical uh, least squares done variable, done variable estimator without any correction. The second one is the PCSE estimator as, uh, as for uh, back and cuts, this is this and the last two columns are bias corrected estimators. So BCFE and LSDV. Right, so you, you should finish your talk in five minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, now we can see that uh, trade seems to significantly reduce uh, income inequality. So it, this is the Gini index. So it seems to significantly reduce the Mark Gini index at 1% significance level. And we can also see that uh, misallocation is uh, significantly negatively associated with, uh, with income inequality. So it, it shows that countries with high misallocation tend to have lower income inequality or countries where uh, there is higher allocated efficiency tend to have higher income inequality. And uh, uh, what we can see here is that the interaction term between trade and misallocation is, is positive, significantly positive. So it shows that uh, as like per se trade uh, reduces income inequality, but um, like misallocation then impairs this uh, favorable distributional effect of trade. So misallocation then weakens the, the uh, inequality reducing effect of trade. And uh, when I use the Palmer ratio of disposable income, I use, I, I take, uh, I get the results which are like similar in sign, um, but, uh, like the level of significance a bit smaller here, but still uh, the, the results are significant and, and they are similar in terms of the sign. So we have uh, trade uh, which, uh, which decreases income inequality, misallocation, which is negatively associated, associated with income inequality and uh, um, like the interaction term is positive, meaning that this misallocation tends to, to uh, weaken the inequality reducing effect of trade. Now, uh, my results then uh, support the, the early findings, some early findings that trade openness uh, reduces income inequality. Uh, I do not know the exact mechanism through which trade may reduce income inequality uh, because I do not model the trade here, but uh, this result may, uh, may be supportive of the hump-shaped relationship between trade and income inequality, which is uh, predicted by the theoretical model uh, uh, of, of Haltman and, uh, and co-authors. Uh, they show that trade at the, at the very beginning when the country opens up to trade from autarky, trade uh, increases income inequality, but at, uh, after it reaches a certain level, trade may fur further increase in trade may reduce income inequality. So it may be because the, in, in my case, all countries are from the beginning of the sample, uh, all the countries were already quite open. So the, the, my results do not just show the, the uh, effect of opening to trade from autarky. So they just show the effect of, uh, of increased trade from already open, uh, open countries. 
Now, uh, an important finding is that if the distortions in the input markets act as, as, as a tax on the use of these inputs, then misallocation uh, that arises from, the, from these distortions impairs the effect of trade on income inequality. And the countries with a more efficient allocation of resources, they tend to have a high income inequality citrus paribus. Now, uh, to conclude, I propose a new factor that conditions the effect of trade openness on uh, within country income inequality. I use a panel of 18 European countries, and I find that more trade reduces income inequality in the counterfactual absence of misallocation, but uh, high misallocation then would lead to a smaller uh, effect of trade. So uh, as misallocation increases, the inequality improving effect of trade uh, gradually disappears, and uh, my results show that it may even reverse at sufficient high levels of misallocation. And uh, countries with a high level of mislocation, on the other hand, they, uh, they tend to have a more equal uh, income distribution. Now, okay, my study is not without limitations, of course, and uh, it's still ongoing research and uh, having a theoretical model that is able to explain the causal effect of trade and income inequality together with its relation to mislocation, of course, would be uh, desirable. And uh, because my empirical findings are not based on large samples, so my sample is relatively small sample, so it still may not be uh, desirable to generalize my results. Thank you. That's it. If there are, you have any questions, I can answer. So, uh, thank you, Rajal, um, for your presentation. Uh, there are no questions raised during the presentation, okay. uh, but since we have some minutes left, I don't know if there are uh, uh, there is someone that uh, wants to ask a question right now, or um, do we want to move to the last presentation? Okay, so if there are no questions, of course, you can also ask by sending an email to, uh, you can interact with Bezod after the presentation. Uh, and so if there are no other questions, I would move to the last presentation. So I will present uh, my paper and uh, I think that uh, Oscar will act as chair. Uh, indeed, Daniela, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce you and you will tell us something about patents and trade and how everything is related. I will warn you after 15 minutes so that you know if you are on track or not. And uh, the floor is all yours. Success. Thank you, Oscar. Um, so I... I need to stop my video, or is it still... Uh... Okay, so, um, so yeah, this is um, what I'm going to present is a joint work with uh, Gaetan de Rassen Fosse from uh, Ecole Polytechnique di Lausanne, Marco Grazzi from uh, Università Cattolica di Milano, and Gabriele Pellegrino is also from uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, uh, Ecole Polytechnique. Um, so um, this is a paper on uh, um, the effect on international patent protection and trade transaction level evidence. Uh, in this first slide, I will try to give you a very general uh, overview of the paper what we try to do in this study and what we uh, accomplish. So this will allow me not to go through all the results uh, since we don't have uh, um, enough time. Of course, you, 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 can, you, you can look at the paper for more uh, extension in terms of the, of the results, but to give you an overview, uh, what we um, investigate in, in this paper is the um, relationship between patent and export. That is, we look for patent premium in terms of export 
volumes, price, and quantity. Okay, so this allows us to, in a sense, to disentangle a monopoly effect from a market expansion effect. Uh, we have very rich data set that will, uh, I will illustrate that allow us to control for a variety of confounding factors and uh, ultimately to distinguish between a patent protection effect from a more generic innovation effect. We study the relative timing of exporting and patenting uh, and uh, uh, also in doing this we match, so we put together a very rich data set at a firm product country level on the one end export data and on the other end patent data of exporting firm. So this is the first time that um, such a match data set is used to investigate uh, transaction, transaction data. Okay, so this was a very general overview to introduce, to give you some background Okay, behind our research question, uh, there is a lot of evidence supporting the view that intellectual property rights are relevant in explaining international trade flows. Okay, so we have um, uh, both uh, aggregate county industry level evidence. Okay, so looking at countries that have more uh, uh, patents, for example, country sector, and how this uh, is related to having a better performance on international markets. We also have uh, some evidence at the firm level uh, about the relationship between innovation patents and one on the one end and export on the other end. Be careful that this is evidence at the firm level. Okay, so just firm level. Um, so in this in this perspective usually patents are more an expression of superior capability okay so usually when you measure uh, patents on the country level at sector level at firm level you are really not able to distinguish in a sense patents as a proxy of uh, let's say having more capability to innovate uh, from patents as a mean to better protect your innovation so these results are um, for sure in line with theoretical empirical evidence of sex self-selection um, into international trade. So these results are for sure in line with the literature on international trade. So in this respect, it is not surprising to find a higher propensity to export among patenting firms. However, uh, these are not really able to tell us something about the, um, the role of patents in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property right. Okay, so if, you, if we take this different perspective, that is the institutional perspective, we have a bunch of literature that says that uh, um, a strengthening of uh, international property rights in a country leads to more export to that country. Okay, uh, and again, these studies are the, at the industry level export data, with one exception is uh, the Lean and Lincoln uh, paper in 2017, that is the first to exploit a matched firm level data set on export and patent, uh, and they find that patenting firms are more likely to export to country that went through a strengthening of uh, IP protection. However, so, if in this first literature that is the, the more, um, let's say, aggregate of firm level literature, what we know is that patents is positively related to trade. In the institutional literature, we know in general that uh, institutional um, uh, institutions that protect uh, um, property rights are important to protect and to, to increase export. However, in this literature is not clear the mechanism that is, uh, that is at play. Okay, so the finding that um, in, um, intellectual property institution enable international trade can arise from two mechanisms that are not mutually exclusive. 
but with different policy implication, of course. Okay, on the one hand, it could be that uh, an increase in the strength of protection led to technological upgrading by local firms, which in turn is conducive to international trade. On the other hand, it could be that an increase in the strength of protection might provide the necessary guarantee for exporting firms to start selling in the target market. Okay, so the available evidence is not able to discriminate uh, between these two channels. The reason why we don't have this uh, identification is that previous works can buy whether the exported goods are protected by patents in the export markets. Okay, so we know we have evidence of a positive relationship between uh, um, patents and export at the firm level. Okay, but what we want to know is if there is um, a conditional positive relationship between patents and uh, export at the firm product level, which is, of course, uh, uh, exactly what we need to know in order to address uh, the more institutional perspective. So the first contribution that we give is that uh, we measure we observe whether uh, a good is protected by patent in a specific destination market. We also investigate if the export premium is related to a general innovation effect or to a patent protection effect. And also the source of export premium. The source of export premium. Is it a quantity effect, a price effect, both? Okay, so in, in order to answer this question, we will exploit using our data uh, three uh, sources of heterogeneity, two cross-sectional sources. Okay, so we will investigate whether a given product exported by two firms in a given country, the difference in the export premium in these two cases, a country uh, source of variation, so a given product by given firm exported to two countries, where the product is uh, protected in one country but not in the other. And finally, we, we will also exploit time variation, okay? So we will observe changes in patent protection status over time for a given product by given firm in a given country. We will accomplish this by uh, making regression with a uh, multiple set of fixed effects. Uh, so our empirical analysis proceeds in two steps. First, we investigate the timing. So whether the decision to file for a patent uh, um, is associated with a higher likelihood to export in that country. And then in the second part, conditional on a firm product country uh, being uh, an, uh, an active uh, trade flow, we investigate how patent protection uh, in a country is associated with the level of export in that country, considering also quantity and price. Uh, in order to do this exercise, we use transaction level data. These are export from French custom at the firm product country level. Uh, during a period of uh, around 10 years from 2002 to 2011, we can compute export value and quantity. We have a um, product data that are originally categorized at eight digit, but we aggregate a six digit to have a more homogeneous category over time. And of course, unit value as it standard in this literature can be computed as export value over quantity. Uh, we also have, uh, we match this data set uh, with uh, patent data using a patent application to um, uh, patent office all around the world. We use data on patent application and we assume that the average lifetime of patent is 10 years. So just to give you a very um, um, overview of the data set, so this is a slice of the data set in one year. So this is a cross-sectional cross snapshot of the data set in 2011. You will see that uh, in column one, uh, you have uh, the statistics related to uh, the export data. 
So we have around 90,000 um, 90, uh, firms uh, and around uh, 4,000 product category and 230 countries. In the second columns, we report statistics on the uh, number of firms and patents from the um, patent database. And then in, in all the other columns, we report statistics where we match together the export data set and the patent data set at different level of the aggregation. So in column three, we show what happens when we consider only the firm as a source of patenting activity. In column five, for example, we assign a patent not just to a firm, but to a firm product. Okay. Um, so what is crucial in doing this exercise is to be able, what is one of the novel contribution of this work, is to be able to match patents to a product. And we do this by using uh, the probabilistic algorithm uh, described by, um, developed by Libert and Zola in the 2014 uh, paper, and also in the Goldschlag et al. paper in 2016. So basically this algorithm exploit a concordance between the harmonized system, which is the usual way in which you categorize uh, exported goods and uh, the cooperative pattern classification, which is the usual way in which you categorize technological uh, uh, classes of patents. Um, okay, so the, um, just keeping uh, the descriptive in the first exercise, uh, which is quite compelling, we address the question, does patenting tend to anticipate exporting? or vice versa? And the answer is yes. Usually when uh, uh, firms, uh, a patenting firms wants to export a given product to a given country, usually this firm first apply for a patent for that specific product in that specific country and then export. So there is a given a very precise uh, time pattern in, according to which first you patent and then you export. Um, and the, uh, um, this time dimension we also estimate uh, in a more precise way by running a regression in which on the left hand side we have uh, a dummy which is zero or one according to whether a firm is exporting in a given country or not. So it's a zero one uh, regression. And then on the right hand side, we have a dummy according to which uh, is a zero one dummy according to which a firm has a patent in that specific country. Okay, so it's a zero one. We perform this regression by applying a multidimensional fixed effect. So we are able to control for firm fixed effect, country year fixed effect in the first and second columns. And for firm country fixed effect in the third and fourth column. And what we find is that there is a close, a strong positive relationship between having applied for a patent in a given country and, uh, uh, and the probability to export in that country, also conditional to already uh, having exporting in that country. Yes, uh, Daniele, uh, yes. just to let you know that you have spoken for 15 minutes. Uh, please yeah, do yeah, continue. Minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So having established first, that uh, uh, usually you first observe a patenting activity and then an export activity. And second, that uh, um, there is a positive relationship between the probability to export and patenting activity. We now study conditional on exporting in a given market, that is in a given destination, a given product, the relationship between having a patent, so again, this is a zero one dummy, and uh, on the left hand side, uh, the logarithm of total value, quantity, and unit value of the firm's export in the country product value. 
Okay, so this is our main estimation in this, uh, with this um, exercise, we are able to estimate patent premium. Patent premium within a given destination product market in terms of total export, quantity, and price. Um, we, do the, we do this first on cross sections. Okay, so we take one year. Um, uh, in this case, is uh, 2011. And we estimate whether there is um, a, a positive premium. So in this case, controlling for country product of fixed rate, and we find that uh, yes, there is a, uh, a positive export premium that is due to a quantity effect, uh, and also in this case to a, a price effect. However, when we control for firm product fixed effect, okay, so when we account for the specific product, um, the export premium is entirely driven by a quantity premium. Okay, so we do observe a positive relationship between uh, patent and export, but differently from what you might expect based, for example, on a sort of monopoly story in which you have a patent, you apply for a patent, and by applying for a patent, you should be able to set an higher price for that product. This is not what we find. What we find is that there is a positive relationship between patent and export, but this is only due to a quantity effect. And uh, this result, uh, that is that the export premium is due to a quantity premium, also holds when we move uh, to uh, a, panel, the, a panel estimation. So in this case, we were estimating a cross-section, so one year. Now we move to a sort of before and after, after effects. So we take the whole panel of uh, product country trade flows. We control for fur product country fixed effects. So we study what happens when there is a switch, in a sense. What happens when within a given fur product country, um, there is an activation in the patenting activity. You see that uh, there is a positive uh, uh, export premium, which is entirely due to a quantity premium. There is even a very small, uh, significant, but with very uh, not a lot of economic meaning of the negative uh, price premium. Uh, we do some robustness. In particular, we run a placebo analysis. Uh, we show that uh, results are not driven by random, uh, uh, just by a, a random effect in the data. We also account for selection. Uh, so we account for the fact that, of course, when we estimate a positive uh, premium, we only estimate this on exporting firms. When we account for this, we again, we recover a positive uh, patent premium. Okay, so concluding remarks, the results of the empirical analysis provide a very new perspective of the patenting and exporting behavior of firms. Um, the cross-sectional evidence suggests a positive export premium of around 30%. This is smaller when we exploit the longitudinal dimension. So let's say that the export premium is between 30 and 10%. However, all these export premia are driven by quantity premium, not by price premium. Um, uh, so taken together, the results point to the existence of a relevant patent premium on the export value for transactions associated with patent protection. And overall, the evidence support more the market expansion hypothesis than the monopoly effect of a patent. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, it is, uh, I have a colleague who is also very much into this field, the relations between patents and trade, and I think he's going to love this paper. Uh, I myself liked that you do not have like the, the major results, uh, like uh, untangling the, the protection effect and the innovation effect, but even on the way you have the smaller things 
that one might think, okay, it's logical, but did not have proof yet, eh, such as the, what is going to be first. How do you first have the exports or first the patents? Eh, you, you have that and it is actual empirical proof for what before was a hunch. Um, I look at the Q&A. I do not see questions there yet. I do have some questions of my own, uh, but if someone would have to add something, a remark or a question, uh, I invite her or him to do so now. Not that much is happening, so uh, I will go to my own questions uh, myself. And if other people would have questions in the meantime, please do mention them in the questions and answer box uh, below at the screen. Um, well, let me start where. Um, first of all, I was wondering about the firm data. Here it is, you have a relatively old sample, 2002, 2011. Uh, we also noticed that if you deal with patents, sometimes the data is old. Maybe that is one of the reasons or uh, that it simply was the data set available. Um, I did not see, but that, that doesn't mean that it is not there. Um, if you have, um, what is it called, firm specifics like the industry where a firm is or the size of a firm. It is, I think it would be canceled out if you used fixed effects anyway, but could you elaborate a little bit on that, please? Yes, thank you for your question, which uh, exactly allow me to, to spend a little bit more on the, on the data set. So regarding the time dimension, um, yes, I mean, that the, um, Basically, in principle, I mean, this uh, time setting is due to two effect. One is on the patent data, which was, uh, uh, I mean, we had data up until 2014. And then in the last year, due to some lag, uh, you have uh, less and less uh, precise estimate of the number of patents. And then this also due to the fact that um, when we match the patent uh, classification to the harmonized system classification, the harmonized system classification changes every five uh, years. So there was another revision in 2012. And so um, uh, what we was possible to do was to use uh, up until 2011 in such a way that we did not have to make also a concordance with the new revision uh, in 2012, which basically would give us just uh, two or three more years. So this was a sort of compromise between having a coherent uh, data set, uh, even if, as you say, is getting older in a sense now. Uh, regarding your second question, yes, you are right. I mean, we don't have a firm specific variable because in our main data set is um, custom data. So all variables refer to uh, transaction, basically. So we observe uh, a transaction, so a, a specific firm product destination flow. Of course, we can construct uh, firm specific variables, for example, uh, total size as measured by total export. Or we could measure um, total number of products. But as you say, we use a very rich set of fixed effects. So basically, since we are really interested in uh, understanding what happened for a given firm and a given product that is exporting into different destinations, for example, in one destination, you apply for a patent. In the other destination, you did not apply for a patent. Then all these uh, firm-specific variables, yes, would cancel out uh, in a sense in the analysis. Um, so that's why we do not include. And again, we don't have really firm level variable apart from the variable that we could construct from the export, uh, the transaction level data set.
Yes, thank you. It is, uh, it's always a problem with the data that one would like to have more, but not always things are available. Yeah. And because I was wondering, I, I can imagine that uh, if you are a smaller firm or a larger firm that could influence the, the patent uh, possibilities, uh, that if you are a small one, uh, maybe you do not have the money for a patent, uh, or uh, maybe you really want to have a patent because you only have like a very few products and you really, really want to protect them. Whereas a larger firm thinks, okay, I have thousands of products and who cares? Uh, and I guess that also there will be industries where it's important to have a patent like the, the pharmaceuticals and the other ones, maybe not, but well, it's, it's, it's difficult to get that type of data. And, uh, you would have to do it maybe on the product base that uh, I think your idea of looking at exporter is it large and that could indeed give some information and maybe also if you look at the, the major products that you can derive an industry somehow uh, if you do not can get access to the actual data um, I have a look because I do not want to be too egoistic with my questions no <laughs> no I'm everybody oh. is shy I, I will simply continue uh, in that case, um, I remember my colleague who works on the patents, he says that sometimes it's also important to have a look at the quality of the patent and uh, measured by the number of times that the patent were cited in, in other patents, uh, things like that. And uh, I was wondering if it would be possible with your type of data and uh, just a general thought. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, on the first question, uh, yes, you are right. I mean, in the sense that uh, there could be heterogeneity in the effect of patent. Uh, we have an exercise in the paper. I didn't have time to show it, but uh, in which we explore the heterogeneity across industries. So, for example, uh, we see that uh, there is a price premium in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, which is, in a sense, I mean, is what you would expect. I mean, that uh, it is an industry in which, I mean, uh, patents are more likely to act as a sort of uh, monopoly uh, uh, givers. Uh, yes, another possibility which we didn't explore is to uh, to 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 explore. Um, firm heterogeneity in terms of size. So uh, I take this as a, um, a good suggestion. In terms of uh, quality, in principle, uh, yes. I mean, uh, you have, I mean, we have the publication number of the patent. So using the publication number, in principle, you can recover other information of the patent, for example, uh, through the PATSTAT database. Um, in our let's say in our qualitative uh, qualitative uh, hypothesis framework, uh, of course, the quality of the patent should not be relevant in the sense that, of course, uh, since we observe that, for example, uh, you patent and then in the same year you start to export. So you really don't have time uh, to observe citation. No? I mean, you, you expect that as soon as you patent, uh, you say, okay, now I can export because now you have this protection. So in order to capture this protection effect, maybe uh, the quality of a patent is less of an issue. Uh, but, but in principle, you can add uh, citation because we have the publication number. So in a sense, you can identify other uh, patent characteristics using a patent database like uh, PATSTAT, for, for example. Yes, thank, thank you very much. I would one nobody nobody seems to have a question, which means that the presentation was really really clear. I have one tiny last one. Um, I have seen in recent literature quite a lot uh, about the, the unit value, uh, where the people say that the and I know I've been working at trade statistics for several years. I know that the quantity information is by far not as good as the value information. 
So in recent literature, I see quite some people doing a bit of a cleaning process on the data to get rid of strange things. Uh, it is at Statistics Netherlands somewhere in time, a colleague stopped by and said, according to our statistics, we have imported enough strawberries to give every Dutch person a meter of strawberries this month. So this cannot be right. Um, did you clean the data for to get at uh, unit value date, unit value or? Uh, yeah, we yeah 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 we applied some uh, sort of cleaning uh, in the sense that this kind of uh, data, so the French export data are nowadays have been quite used in the literature. Uh, so there there are papers that have already used. So we know what are the issues in this data. As you say, as you say, there is some an issue regarding the quantity. I would say not is not a general issue. In, the, in this case, is limited to some years in which we know that uh, for some specific uh, class of products, quantity is not correctly measured, and there are uh, ways to clean for this. Uh, and we follow what is I mean nowadays that. Uh, it's not the standard, but sort of guidelines to clean this kind of data. Of course, I mean, if your question is more related to an underlying concern about the quality of the data, I mean, of course, these are, in a sense, first uh, quality data because are transaction level. So they are really, I mean, uh, there should be high quality data, in a sense, as a first approximation. Uh, so all the cleaning that we apply is the cleaning that is suggested in the literature. So we did not notice uh, any other uh, issues specific to our data. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see no, no questions appearing. So I think I will take the liberty of thanking all the speakers, all the people who are present at our presentations. And it's always happy to have some people interest in your work. And I think that's it for now. Okay. Yes. Thank you also on my side to everybody, to all presenters and attendees. Okay, good. Well, then I wish everybody a pleasant day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.